Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Craig Smith. Um, I'm the host of this meeting. Today, we we're pleased to present another series of uh, another lecture in the series of lockdown lectures. This is one by Haley Kothra, Dr. Haley Kothra, who received her PhD from UCT some years ago and has worked since for the CGS, the Council for Geoscience in Belleville, as Chief Scientist Marine Geology. Uh, she is also a research associate, African Center for Coastal Paleoscience at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth. Uh, she's going to talk to us today about the South African Cape's lost world reconstructing the extinct landscape submerged by the sea, which you can see in your screen. And with that, Haley, take it away. Uh, there'll be time for questions and answers after your talk, but go for it. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if anyone can't hear properly or anything, please somehow let us know because it's the first time I'm doing a presentation over Zoom this way. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to present some of our work to you this afternoon. And um, as Craig said, I'm going to be talking about the Cape South Coast and the adjacent continental shelf, which has been the focus of my research for the last 10 years or even more. Um, ultimately, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to... Oops. I'm sorry, I'm just... Oh, there we go. Ultimately, at the end of the presentation, um, I'm going to come back to this map that's shown here right now, which is... Um, a geological map of the last glacial maximum, which is the first that we know of that's been made globally, which is something that we're quite proud to have, to have compiled over this last decade. So to give you a little bit of context, a few different lines of context, um, firstly, why we map the seafloor and why we invest in the marine environment. Of course, we live on the blue planet. The Earth's surface is covered by about 71% of ocean water and um, Although the ocean dominates the, the surface of the Earth, we know more about the planets like Mars, Jupiter, and the Moon than we do about our own seafloor, which is pretty astounding. Um, being able to map the seafloor, it's quite a new, new thing in geology. Marine geology, in this sense, has only been around since the years succeeding World War II, when sonar systems that were designed to look for submarines and sea mines um, were sort of change to be able to look downward and map the seafloor. This map that's on your screen at the moment is, um, it was the first seamless map produced of the ocean floor. And it was produced in 1977, um, following 25 years of compilation, mostly from World War II data. This map was published by the National Geographic Society and it was compiled by Marie Tharp who there's a book written about her called The Story of the Remarkable Woman Who Mapped the Ocean Floor. And she painstakingly gridded by hand um, all sorts of contours in order to produce this map. Um, like I said, mostly from World War II systems that were acquiring acoustic data. So nowadays, um, in order to map the seafloor, for example, at the Council for Geoscience where I work, my colleagues and I mount sensors onto ships and boats and we literally, we steam up and down and what we do what we call mowing the lawn. So we try and achieve seamless coverage, coverage with the geophysical data sets and instruments. Um, unfortunately, there's no method yet to map the seafloor from using remote sensing techniques because electromagnetic waves, such as acoustic waves, become highly attenuated through seawater. So in order to collect these kind of data, we still have to mount instruments on vessels, calibrate them, interface them. And, and steam up and down. So um, it takes a fair amount of time, especially in this case, this is multi-beam that's shown on the screen. It works on a swath system. So the shallower the water depth, the narrower the swath. The deeper the water's depth, the wider the swath. So in order to map the continental shelf, it's particularly challenging because it's generally quite a shallow environment. So um, another line of context to quickly explain is that sea level is certainly not static and it fluctuates constantly uh, in relation to glacier eustatic sea level change which is linked to ice age and interglacial cycles so these episodic periods of cooling and warming um, have taken place right throughout the pleistocene period and the implication is that when you have an ice age or a period of cooling water is held up in the ice caps in the polar regions global sea level falls, and continental shelves are exposed to terrestrial landscapes, such as the red areas that are shown on this map around here. Um, a sea level curve 
it's shown above on the top part of this slide, the red bar being present sea level as a, as a benchmark. And you can see that for about 90% of the quaternary period, in this case, the last 430,000 years, sea level has actually been lower than what it is today. And that means that the continental shelf has been exposed as a terrestrial landscape for about 90% of this time. The implication for geology is that as sea level shifts across this, this continuous plain, which includes the current coastal plain and the submerged continental shelf, which are two parts of actually one feature that's exposed according to relative sea level at any time. What happens is that beaches, dunes, rivers, wetlands, marshlands, all the features you find along a typical coast move with the, the contemporary sea level. Um, the, for the quaternary period, the maximum sea levels recorded are about 13 meters above present, and the minimum depths are about 130 meters below present. So that's the kind of spectrum that we're looking at. Sometimes these remnant features are preserved on continental shelves, and those are the things that I'm going to be presenting to you today, which we like to study. and can, can give indications on rates of sea level change in the past, kinds of environments, kinds of shorelines, etc. The geology of the Cape area um, is pretty well known to most people, of course, in South Africa, especially any geologists. Cape Fault Belt is about a 3,000 meter elevation feature that separates the interior of the Karoo from the coastal plain and the adjacent shelf. Um, however, although most geological maps end at the shoreline, um, of course, the features do extend below sea level. Um, parts of the Cape Fault Belt trend out onto the seabed but not in very many places. For the most part, the offshore environment is dominated by Mesozoic and Cenozoic rocks that were laid down into newly formed structural basins that creates, were created as um, the supercontinents of Gondwana fragmented. So in the case of the Cape South Coast, the seafloor is dominated by the Bredalsdorp group deposits, Petmos group, I'm sorry, Petmos Basin, which are part of the Southern Otanikwa Basin. Uh, most of the things I'll present to you today fall within this block that's shown on the screen now, from Cape Agulhas to about um, Plettenberg Bay. So the South African offshore environment is um, it's particularly unique. We have the convergence of three oceans, the Indian, the Atlantic and the Southern Ocean, that lead to very interesting and complex um, oceanographic flow and current exchange. We have the warm Magellus current coming down the east coast, intercepting the cold Benguela that moves up the west coast. And they kind of meet along the Cape South Coast offshore area, which makes for very rich biodiversity and interesting vegetation on the adjacent coastal plain. With the sea level fluctuations that I spoke about earlier and an extremely wide continental shelf, this area has really well preserved quaternary rocks. The onshore outcrops of these rocks are shown on this map in the top part of the slide, um, shown in yellow. Uh, west of Titsikama is the Bredasdorp group, and east of Titsikama is the Algora group deposits. Quite a lot of work has been done on the onshore or high stand data associated with these deposits, but they do also extend onto the continental shelf in certain places. Um, they're particularly interesting rocks for reconstructing sea level, and especially if you look for the contact between the foreshore and the shore face, that gives a sea level indicator that's accurate to one or two meters, which isn't fantastic, but for a geological sea level indicator, it's pretty good and generally is good enough. Um, the high stand deposits have allowed quite a lot of understanding of how high sea level has been in the past and how quickly it reached those elevations. Um, a lot of work done around Mossel Bay on the Clanbrack River by my late colleague Dave Roberts. He did some excellent work on these coastal deposits all along the coast. But specifically on the Clanbrack River in Mossel Bay, um, they worked out that sea level had been 13 meters above present sea level elevation, with some modeling taking into account glacier eustatic corrections. Um, this maximum sea level is estimated to be about 11 meters above sea level. And that's the worst case scenario of what we anticipate for this present period of warming now. Um, so this part of Southern Africa is a great natural laboratory for studying sea level change, global change, and all sorts of processes in the Pleistocene. Coupled with the geology, 
We also have a very rich archaeological record on the Cape South Coast. Specifically, the Middle Stone Age record is world famous. Um, there are many sites along our Neo Coast that have um, some of the best preserved Middle Stone Age deposits anywhere on Earth. I'm not a, an archaeologist by any means, um, but just to give you a little bit of context in this regard, um, the genetic studies of the L. haplogroup, which is the oldest genetic lineage of Homo sapiens, indicate that the progenitor population may have originated around sub Saharan Africa and maybe perhaps somewhere near the Cape South Coast. Um, people obviously shifted up and out of Africa through the Levantine Corridor and the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and there were four different lineages of hominins coexisting for um, several tens of thousands of years. So what remains now is that only our direct species um, remains. So archaeologists and anthropologists have done a lot of work on the Cape South Coast to figure out various things about the, the occupation, but also um, what led to maybe the demise of other species that were coexisting. Archaeological and paleoanthropological studies are very rich and intense, and there's always new data coming out. Um, for example, three years ago, there was a new discovery published from Morocco, which indicated that there may be evidence for um, our early species from 300,000 years ago. But every year, more and more, especially genetic work, comes out on this sort of topic. Taking us to Pinnacle Point, which is the focus of most of where our work started, um, like I said before, the Cape South Coast Middle Stone Age record is very rich and shown here as some, a map of the Calders, Blombos, Pinnacle Point, Nelson Bay Cave, and Classy's River map, just as some examples. Pinnacle Point um, has a, a sequence of 30 vertical meters, which is an excellent opportunity to get a, a window um, into this paleo record and this time where people were existing in the same environment which we live now. Um, our work started in Pinnacle Point. I've been collaborating with Kurt, Curtis Marion and his team for more than 10 years now. And the main question that um, my work has tried to figure out is what was the character of the coastline through time and what is the character of the continental shelf as a terrestrial landscape when it was exposed? This shelf is about 100 kilometers wide off Mossel Bay um, during the minimum uh, sea levels during glacial periods. And the implication is that on the Cape South Coast, 80,000 square kilometers of extra land is exposed during times of low sea level. That's the same size as the island of Ireland, incidentally. So it's a large area that's now um, submerged under the water. A lot of the archeological records along the Cape South Coast indicate a strong reliance on the coast by the populations that were living along there. And we've been able to do some really interesting work in correlating the offshore geophysical records, which are generally quite low resolution, with super high resolution cave records, which have things like shellfish preserved, bones, lithics, all sorts of interesting um, remnants from our past. So the, the sort of logic flow of doing this work was to consider the coastal plain and the, continent, and the continental shelf as one continuous feature. Um, look at the continental shelf evolution from a marine geological point of view. Take this into trying to understand evidence for Pleistocene sea level fluctuations, and then looking at the continental shelf as a terrestrial landscape. So from the geology structural base, trying to work on landscape, soils, plants, people, animals, etc. The idea for this work actually goes back to almost 50 years ago. By, and the first paper present, published that presented these ideas was by Professor Dingle and Dr. John Rogers in 1972. Um, they, there's an excerpt from their paper attached here which says that the present contribution is an attempt to provide a paleogeographical background against which other scientific disciplines, for example, archaeology, botany, meteorology, and zoology, can view Pleistocene phenomena at the southern tip of Africa. So for the time, that was really foresighted. And at the time, they weren't really able to test these hypotheses. But now with you know, better instruments for mapping the sea floor and um, analytical improvements, we're able to really take this on. The aspirations and inspirations for our work have come from two 
um, excellent publications which are shown on the left hand side of the slide is, is a, a sort of a compilation on the Serengeti as an ecosystem, a complete ecosystem. Um, and this was published in the 80s, as well as um, Feinbos considerations that look at ecology from the point of view of animals, people, geology, everything within that ecosystem. Um, the first paleoecology of Feinbos publication also came out in the 1980s um, by Deacon and Lancaster. So we've kind of been building on this idea of an entire ecosystem that might now be extinct in our case because it's underwater. And we call this area offshore of the Cape South Coast, the Paleoregalis Plain. And we've actually just had our special issue published in the journal called Ternary Science Reviews. Last week, in fact, it went online. And um, three of us have guest edited 22 papers, which cover all aspects of our workflow and pretty holistic idea of this entire region, um, using geology, geophysics, modeling, paleoclimates, archeology, span uh, botany, all sorts of, of aspects of work, which I won't go into today, going to mostly focus on geology and geophysics with a little bit of interpretation um, from our work included towards the end. So my job was to map the seafloor and to understand the geology along the coast. Um, we did this back in 2011 um, using Council for Geoscience Equipment and Vessels. We spent three months in Mossel Bay, my colleagues and I, mapping out the seafloor um, in high resolution in the bays of Mossel Bay and Fleerspy. We used side scan sonar, multi beam bathymetry, two different types of shallow seismic methods, Bruma and Pinger, which penetrates about 100 meters axially down into the upper continental shelf. Um, and we also did quite a lot of sampling by scuba diving, um, which had its challenges. Mussel Bay is not really famous for tropical diving, it's more famous for sharks, so we had to use cages and special things. Um, the water is also not particularly clear, so it was fairly difficult. So we did about 50 dives and retrieved big enough samples to be dated by optically stimulated luminescence dating by Zenobia Jacobs at the University of Wollongong. And um, Robin Pickering from UCT um, has plans with me to try and date the uranium thorium cements or using uranium series to try and understand the dating of the deposition of these deposits compared to the cementation. So there's still a lot of exciting work going on with those, those samples that we got. We also um, have worked on a bilateral German South African project called RAIN, which is Regional Archives for Integrated Investigations since 2012. And for RAIN, we've taken six marine cores off the southern coast shelf um, in paleo rivers, paleo lakes, all sorts of environments that are identified with geophysics as being good areas to call for terrestrial material preserved offshore. So overall, um, the data sets that I'm going to keep drawing on today are uh, shown up here. We've got six cores that are indicated with stars. They're off the Breda River, Horowitz River, Mussel Bay, and Wilderness. Um, and the, the lines are seismic profiles, which gave a really good idea of the st structure of the shelf. Um, and then we have super high resolution data in that blue area, which is just fierce by Mussel Bay. So looking into the data sets, um, the geophysics shows us multi-beam, which gives you depth data on the seafloor, like a topographic map. Um, it showed that for the most part, the seafloor is quite planed and quite flat and quite featureless, but there are definitely pockets of fascinating geology, such as offshore of the Great Brack River. There are these linear Pleistocene paleo coastlines preserved all the way out. And those are the ones that we dived and sampled and have worked on a lot. Um, we also see that the gradient of the shelf drops off quite steeply. If you can see my mouse, it's pointed on pinnacle points on the gray part of the map. And from here, the shelf terrace drops off pretty quickly before it flattens out onto the mid shelf. And this is interesting for, the, for comparing to archeological records. Um, it meant that with a steep terrace just adjacent to the site and sea level rose a little bit, the coast would have encroached um, quite quickly. So some of the geomorphic features on the shelf are coastal caves that are now preserved underwater. Um, on the bottom image, you can see a Google Earth shot from the current Pinnacle Point um, coast. And those little embayments that are preserved all the way along also extend onto the seabed out for a distance of about three kilometers adjacent to Cape St. Labes towards the east. Um, 
we did dive in these looking for any remnant archaeological deposits. We didn't expect to find any because of the high energy cost. And in fact, we didn't find any archaeology in these caves. Um, there are also beautiful paleo dunes preserved on the seafloor. Those rocks, those Pleistocene rocks that we've had dated and we're studying, they show that the, dune, the wind direction at the time that these were laid down in glacial periods was relatively similar to the wind directions on the Cape South Coast now. Southwesterlies, Easterlies, for example. There are interesting paleo beaches and paleo coastlines preserved all the way out on the continental shelf. And these have given a very good idea of how quickly sea level fluctuated in the past. We'll get back to that just now. But because it's such a low gradient shelf with small changes in vertical sea level, there's a large horizontal shift. So often these paleo coastlines are sort of stranded as individual ridges across the surface rather than being stacked into beaches like they are on the East Coast. Incised river channels have carved the shelf, but they leave a very interesting pattern too, as a result of this very low gradient geometry. So instead of incising quite deeply and moving quite actively, the rivers seem to be lazy, sort of languid meandering rivers with large swampy environments associated with them. Very shallowly incised, very wide floodplains, and they're kind of probably lazy rivers, more like wetland systems that may dissipate out um, into the sediments below them depending on the substrate. So very different to the Cape South Coast rivers at the moment. This is a bit of a messy slide, but I just wanted to show that we were able to map out most of these river channels using seismic data, especially if you have coast parallel profiles, you're able to intercept the channel of the rivers. And that was how I worked out that they were very shallowly incised and very broad. Um, the Kharitz River specifically has a floodplain of 18 kilometers across, which I thought was quite astounding. I can't picture anything else like that on that landscape today. Um, also, the Khoritz River tends to, it seems to play into a delta at the time of the last glacial maximum, which is pretty different to the character of most fluvial systems on the Cape South Coast presently. Looking at Pleistocene sea level change, a lot of the low stand phases have been um, preserved on the continental shelf. Um, and these have been, I've mapped them out with seismics from where they've been intercepted. And you can see that these dune systems out there were, were pretty well distributed, but probably didn't get too high. Like, for example, at Wilderness, where you have steeply stacked dunes, that probably wasn't the case on the shelf at all. And I think that that slow drainage probably played a role in that too. So perhaps wind wasn't able to transport sediments too far necessarily. Um, looking at sea level changes from the rocks offshore of the Great Brack River, we have a very unique opportunity here to study the fall of sea level, sorry, the rise of sea level from marine ice to stage six, which was a glacial period where sea level was 130 meters lower than present. We were able to track the rise up to six meters above present and then back out towards the last glacial maximum. So we have a complete sea level cycle preserved offshore of the Great Brook River. And interestingly, there are times in the record where sea levels seem to be rising extremely quickly, especially coming out of the penultimate glacial, stage six. Um, you can see that sea level shifted about two kilometers across this landscape at a pretty rapid rate, um, creating these overstep deposits. They all date to about the same time within within a very narrow era margin. So sea level has risen very fast in the past, according to models, probably four or five meters per century at that specific time, which is four or five times faster than it's rising now. And that was 140,000 years ago. The raised sequences of the, along the coast, um, in this case, these are the ones that we were able to correlate the offshore data with the onshore data. But this kind of sequence of the last interglacial, 120,000 or so years, um, deposits, they're very common along the Cape South Coast, and you can see them at most of the river mouths. This is the Great Brook River as an example. From our work, we think that sea level was six to eight meters higher than present at that time. The last, the post-glacial marine transgression, which is the very rapid sea level rise from the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago to the present, it's the last bit of the sea level curve as indicated here. Um, that was when the modern marine sediments were laid down across the shelf. And there are also some interesting things that have been preserved because of a fast rate of rise. So in this case, what I'm showing is an ancient lagoon system 
that would have been stranded on the shelf as sea level was falling towards the last glacial maximum. And then as it swung around and started to rise, it actually overstepped the system and was able to pre preserve these very fine grain deposits. We've had a students in Germany working on some foraminifera and ostracods, micro fossils um, in the marine sediment wedge. And what we see quite interestingly is that in the river channels, a lot of the foraminifera that are preserved are Pleistocene forms or fossil forms. So they seem to have been protected from the, the sort of structural outline of these river channels where everything around them is dominated by more modern forms. And we're working on that at the moment and figuring out how we can use these to help us understand anything about sea surface temperature back in the Pleistocene. Um, the cores that I mentioned earlier that were taken from the Breda River all the way to wilderness, um, we're using those core records to study foraminifera, pollen, all sorts of different things, and especially getting an idea of the rate of change of sea level in the past, especially in the post-glacial marine transgression since the last glacial maximum. Because southern South Africa is relatively tectonically stable and because we were not glaciated during the ice ages, we didn't have any ice down here in the ice ages, just low sea levels. Because of that, this is a really good place in the world to try and study sea level change um, as an analog for other areas. And um, these cores are enabling us to do that. This is a bit of a messy figure, it's still in preparation, but ultimately we're working towards a sea level curve. These cores also indicated some interesting peculiarities in the climate record. And specifically, it's two things that we picked up on off the Choritz River was evidence for the medieval climate anomaly which um, was a humid interval. Um, it's a very hot period, which is normally reported in the Northern Hemisphere. And some people say it's responsible for the rapid spread of the bubonic plague because it was a much warmer climate um, around about several hundred years ago. We see evidence for that down here in the South as well from this core, from sea surface temperature proxies. We also see evidence for the little ice age that followed that several hundred years later. And also very prevalent in the north. If you picture paintings of people ice skating on the Thames River, that was the Little Ice Age. And um, it appears to have had an influence in the south too. Um, the modern sedimentation along this coast is pretty dominated by the presence of the headlands that jut out. So for example, along the Cape South Coast, it's very characteristically defined by these half heart or log spiral bays that are a function of the, the um, older Paleozoic geology. So Table Mountain group sandstones poking out into the sea, Borkerfeld shales being eroded and forming embayments. And the modern sediments generally tend to accumulate in these embayments as a function of a southwesterly swell which pushes them towards the northeast and allows them to accumulate in the lee of these structural features. We're also studying these modern sediments, um, looking at future projections of wave energy and things like that. So taking the geological data and, and trying to step into the realm of emergent shelf terrestrial ecosystems, I'm going to show a couple of things that um, I've been working on specifically with some of my colleagues. Um, firstly, the evidence for a wet environment comes from the presence of many paleo lakes, which are submerged on the seafloor. Some of them we've cored into, and those were the cores that I mentioned earlier. Um, an example is a Paleo Lake off the Great Brook River. If you lower sea level to 35 meters below present, there's a lake the same size as Lungflay in Wilderness, which is preserved out there. Also, evidence for a wet environment from marine calcium carbonate cements in the dune rocks that have been compacted into rock by a process of diagenesis have shown that um, the dune sediments have got cements that have kind of incorporated all sorts of organic matter and soil material, we think, which would indicate probably um, a pretty wet environments out there, either from the groundwater table being close to the surface from this um, shallow gradient shelf, or perhaps from additional rainfall. It's not really clear to say which. Um, stromatolites have also been considered. So a lot of work has been done in the last uh, five to 10 years, especially around Port Elizabeth, on the wild side of Port Elizabeth, where modern living stromatolites um, have been discovered. Firstly, Alan Smith and Ron Yukon found them in Morgan Bay in the Eastern Cape, 
about 10 or 15 years ago, and subsequent to their work, some other sites of modern living stromatolites have been identified and studied. Um, there's a team of researchers at Nelson Mandela University, including Renzo Perecinotto and Gavin Rishworth, that have worked a lot on these modern stromatolites. And we teamed up to look at the geophysical data offshore of Mossel Bay to see if we could find features that resembled stromatolite pools and barrage pools. Because when the shelf is exposed and the gradient is so flat and the rivers are lazily meandering across, they probably have pretty sizable estuaries. Um, if you think of the Cape South Coast rivers now, some of them have estuaries that penetrate 17 kilometers or 18 kilometers. Um, and our thought process was that these rivers wouldn't necessarily be too useful to humans as a freshwater drinking resource. Um, so we've considered the occurrence of schmatolites as an alternative. Looking at the morphology of the coast, as you bring sea level down through time, the log spiral bays tend to disappear when you get to a depth of about 45 meters and deeper on the shelf. And this is just a function of the morphology and the substrate. So, but what's important for our project was to try and consider the implication this would have for shellfish species that live along the coast. So the caves at Pinnacle Points have got very high resolution shellfish records that people were actively using the coasts. At times they're dominated by Donaxera, which lives on sandy beaches. At times they're dominated more by Perna Perna and Olicricorn, or Turbo. So um, using geophysics, we then chose select time slices um, through the low stand record and reconstructed the coast based on the geology and compared them to the shellfish records in order to see if this lined up and made sense and we were able to help each other in both directions. Um, for this work, um, I mostly stripped off the modern sediment wedge because that is a mobile feature that shifts around and it's probably only accumulated in the last few thousand years. And when we're looking at shellfish records that goes back to 167,000 years. So most of the time I would use seismic profiles and remove the modern sediments in order to do that. We took some key spots as test sites, such as 112,000 years ago, where people were bringing a vast range of shellfish species into the Pinnacle Point site. They were bringing in Donaxera, Turbosomaticus, and Perna Perna all at the same time. And actually at 112,000 years ago, the sea level was relatively close to the caves. And you can see up here that there would have been little outcrops of pretty subdued table mountain group sandstone, but also a sandy substrate. So it makes a little bit of sense. Looking at raw materials on the continental shelf to make stone tools, um, we are not sure about the occurrence of silkrete on the seafloor. That's something that's still a question very much ongoing. Um, we haven't cored or found any silkrete on the seabed. We have found a lot of cobble beds though. And um, from, again, from seismic profiles, being able to try and infer what sort of raw materials might have been present and in what kind of abundance. Um, from the core samples taken with the bilateral German South African project, we've been able to see that there were soils on this landscape on the continental shelf and bits of these soil remnants are preserved. For example, there's hematite flowers shown here in this slide. Um, I mean, we always assumed there would be soils out there, but it's nice to actually have evidence to say for sure. Um, from geology into soil, into vegetation, um, a couple of people have taken a stab at vegetation reconstructions. The most recent up to the work of Richard Cowling was John Compton, who was my PhD supervisor. He published a paper in 2011 that was an excellent overview paper of various aspects of human evolution. And um, in this paper, he did a bit of a vegetation reconstruction based on the geology that was known then. And then subsequent to the more um, high resolution work that we've done in the last few years, um, I've been working with Richard Cowling, who's a botanist, and he's come up with a vegetation map that's based on geology and paleoclimate data. Um, and interestingly, it, of course, it closely mirrors the geology maps, which I'll show you just now, but interestingly, there are a few things here that help the archaeological records make sense. So in a lot of the archaeological sites along the Cape South Coast, there's been a bit of a puzzle for many decades because you have grazing animal bones preserved in the caves, but there's nowhere at the moment in the present landscape where these could have lived. But if you lower sea level and look at this flat shelf with extensive grasslands and um, lazy rivers, then it makes sense that they were living just out there in the area that's now underwater. 
um, along the river channels, um, the projected vegetation would be floodplain woodlands, which include savanna species, uh, maybe acacia trees and things like that. And what's been interesting is, um, this is, this is a, an artistic rendering by Maggie Lambert Newman, by the way, um, just trying to sum up what we know about this landscape. But interestingly, comparing um, the vegetation models to bones in the archaeological sites and also footprints preserved in rocks, um, we're able to get a more holistic picture of this ecosystem. So this work is Charles Helm's work. Um, I work closely with him doing a lot of geology to contextualize these sites. He finds incredible footprint sites along the Cape South Coast. My late colleague Dave Roberts started this work where he found elephant footprints near Still Bay. And Charles has taken this further, going working from Arniston to Woody Cape Now in Algoro Bay. He's documented about 300 sites of animal and human trackways from the Pleistocene period, from times ranging from 140,000 years ago, actually to 50,000 years ago now. It says 90 on the slide, but some recent work has changed that. The footprints include some cool animals like Cape lion, which are now extinct, some human trackways, um, and some very unexpected ones, like giraffe trackways, it's still there. So there are no giraffe bones in any of the archaeological sites to date, but these footprints at Still Bay indicate that giraffes were obviously living in this environment. And the presence of the savanna woodland um, kinds of vegetation biomes along the rivers makes a bit of sense that there may have been giraffes supported in this ecosystem. So we've also done a strontium isoscape map, um, which looks at the strontium isotopes in all of the geological units of the Cape South Coast to compare back to animal teeth and bones in archaeological sites. This has been a good reference point for a lot of the work that's subsequently been done. Um, yeah, and then getting back, I'm just going to wrap it up by getting back to my map. <laughs> so I've ended a little bit abruptly on all of that, but I'm soon looking at the time and I better wrap it up soon. So in order to make the geological map the last glacial maximum, of course, I relied most, first and foremost on existing data, especially from the ge geological mapping done in the, from the late 60s to the late 80s. Regional scale maps were produced back then. Um, taking the old data, taking new data, had different resolutions of data preserved in different places or collected in different places. And it was quite difficult to get them into a seamless layered scaled approach. But ultimately, um, with all these layers in GIS and too many um, aspects to the data, I ended up going back to a light table at the Council for Geoscience office, printed everything out on the same scale, and I literally traced through them on tracing paper, digitized it, made a map. Um, and it's based on mapping, sampling, diving, old data, um, interpolating along a strike at some times, et cetera. And um, yeah, this is the, is the map that we've produced. Um, most of the features of the current coastal plain do occur also on the continental shelf, with some exceptions. I'm just gonna zoom in and show you. One of the main exceptions is the Alfred Banks, which is an igneous complex um, situated offshore of Arniston. Um, well, I suppose these could be comparable to the, the volcanic deposits in Heidelberg, in, sorry, Heidelberg, Riversdale and Sutherland. Um, but along the Cape South Coast, directly, there are no other analogues of that. Also, there are a lot more Mesozoic deposits on the shelf, which have allowed for those clay soils and siltstones, things like that as a substrate. Um, the dunes have a different character, the rivers have a different character. The forest turns into a delta. From the geology, we've inferred the soils. And this is from a lot of onshore comparative work. It wasn't just a thumb suck by any means. Um, and from the soils, of course, vegetation maps have been made. Also from the soil texture, we've inferred things about pH and soil depth. It's all hypothetical and open for testing if anyone ever wants to do more work on that. Um, so ultimately, we think that the closest analog for this Paleogallus plain is probably 70 square kilometers of land between Gradarsdorp and the sea around Cape Agullis. Um, we think that that's a little sliver of the Paleogallus plain that's preserved now above modern sea level and um, possibly the only close analog that we actually have. So most of our landscape is now underwater. It will eventually be exposed again, but that's not to say that it will necessarily be the same in character as it was in the past. 
Um, this is a horrible messy figure, but I just want to show that there's still a lot more going on in geoscience research. Although we've published our special issue, I'm not finished out there. We're making sea level curves, we're getting more into detail with seismic stratigraphy. Like I said earlier, I want to work more on chronology with Zenobia Jacobs and Robin Pickering. I'm trying to understand the timing of deposition and cementation of these gene systems. We think that's quite important and interesting to do. We're also working towards the east now, towards Algoa Bay, um, and I've got other work going on in Ponderland. So to sum up the Paleogolis Plain, um, these geological deposits on the emergent shelf were expanded on a greatly exaggerated or ex expanded glacial plain um, compared to the very skinny coastal plain preserved now. There were shallowly and stars, broad meandering rivers that flowed on the shelf, extensive wetlands, water table close to the surface. And we've been able to reconstruct ancient habitats and compare the faunal assemblages and paleoecology present. Um, the submerged portion of the Paleogallus plain is not featureless. People often thought in the past that the Agallus bank was quite featureless. It's by no means featureless, it's just subdued. Um, and this submerged landscape was probably much more fertile than the current Cape Bob Dog fallen. Um, very quickly, in two minutes, I'll show quick what else we're doing. Other, other things I spend my time on is our P5 project in Ponderland. It's the same kind of principle, but in an area with a very narrow continental shelf. We found some excellent archaeological sites in Ponderland that we're doing a lot of really interesting work on at the moment. Um, we're working all the way from, well, basically from Port St. John's up to the Mtemtu River in the north. Um, like I said, in this case, it's a narrow shelf, also with old geology, also with the formation of caves, um, and they have been occupied through time. I'm also doing quite a lot of work in ocean governance science policy at the Council for Geoscience. I like to say it's being responsible about how we use the things that we know. So looking at um, taking sea level change into a context of the future rather than always looking into the past, but we needed the past data in order to project forward. Um, looking at the impact on coasts of rising sea levels, looking at um, policy development nationally and internationally. Um, I'm leading an offshore mapping program at the Council for Geoscience, which I've conceptualized for the last few years. And we're focusing on, we want to ultimately map the entire exclusive economic zone, the whole offshore territory of South Africa, using the highest resolution methods possible. So it'll probably take about 15 years or more, um, depending on the resources that were allocated. But it has started and it is ongoing and we want to map once and use many times. So we want to use the data for many different things and projects um, and we want to produce what I call the real map of South Africa, which includes the offshore shelf. Um, yeah, I've got some students that are enthusiastically working on various projects and some that have just finished up excellent projects, um, different aspects of the work that I do. And um, yeah, that's all from, for now. So, a little bit of an overview of the Paleogallus plane and some other things that we're busy with. Um, so, yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Haley, for a very well illustrated talk. Um, I'm sure there's some questions. You can raise your hand if, uh, if you want to comment or ask a question and uh, unmute your mic when you do so. So take it away. Do we have questions or comments? Uh, Haley, I'll start with one. Um, you mentioned about the midway in the talk, uh, some 140,000 years ago, the sea, you, you had evidence for sea level rise uh, at rates of four to five meters per, se per century. Mm -hmm. is, is that, can that be elsewhere, in the, can you see that elsewhere in the world? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> that seems to be a global thing. It happened, as far as we know, it's happened twice, both times coming out of a glacial period. Um, the first that we know of was 140,000 years ago, and the next time was only about 12,000 years ago. And these have been linked through global studies to meltwater pulses. Most, that seems like the most likely candidate, which means that as the ice caps are becoming more unstable, at some point, a large chunk of ice um, dislocates from the main ice sheets and actually causes global sea levels to, to rise extremely quickly. Um, 
we're not too sure about what drives them. Um, there's a quite a lot of work going on trying to understand these things um, and trying to anticipate whether they could happen again moving forward. Because obviously that would be pretty catastrophic to about 600 million people that live on the coasts globally. Any other questions or comments? Um, yes, it's Robin Pickering here. Um, I've got a question, really. Um, thank you. That was a really beautiful talk. Um, that map is just incredible. Um, I feel like, I don't know if you made the point well enough, like clearly enough to your audience that no map like that exists anywhere else in the world. This is literally a world first in South Africa. So it's really amazing. Um, Haley, I, I'm still in love with the idea of dating the cements, but it does make me really <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you, they had one slide where you said you hadn't really found any silkrete, but I was wondering if you reckon if you found any culcrete on your shelf, because that is much easier to date. Yeah, hi Robin, I didn't know you were here, but it's really cool that you are. Um, and yeah, I, um, I'm not sure about these, the silkrete surfaces. So firstly, I'll say that there is definitely culcrete on the shelf. Um, it was actually Calcrete has been dredged up in the first mapping program. Um, I've read reports on that from the from the 1970s, and it it, it comes up in John Rogers' master's thesis as well. Um, that the the neogene hard grounds that are further out on the outer Regalis bank are mostly made up of of calcrete. but that's obviously quite a lot older than uh, Pleistocene calcrete. So there are more ancient calcretes out there. And I do see a lot of surfaces in the seismic records that are very um, dense surfaces and quite obviously very linear and not very preserved. And um, I've interpreted those to be hard grounds of some sort, so calcrete slash silcrete. Um, and I think they're more likely calcrete. And, um, but it's not clear if they were, um, if they formed in the Pleistocene or maybe in the Neogene before that. Wow. Yeah, and I'm 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 in Haley. It would be awesome to try and date some, <laughs> some samples and try and date them. I've had some success even with uranium lead dating on calcrete, so we can go beyond five hundred thousand as well. It is possible. It's not pretty, but it's possible. So <laughs> no, um, that would be I'm excellent. I'm in. Perfect. Thanks, Robin. That's brilliant. Thank you. Robin, can I ask what the error on those ages are? Um, it depends a lot. With uranium, thorium, our errors are typically, you know, less than 1%, 0.1% errors um, we like. And if you consider on an OSL age, um, their normal errors, which they think are good, are 10%. So, you know, that's like two orders of magnitude better is the normal for uranium, thorium. Um, on calcrete, which is not a speleothermine, it's not ideal material, my errors normally hover around 1%. And um, uranium lead ages also hover between 5 and 1%. And yeah, I, don't, I get really upset if I get anywhere close to 10% errors. So we can be amazingly precise. Thank you for that. Is there, are there any more comments or queries or questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Are you kidding me? Hi, 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 Haley. Yeah. Um, yeah, lovely to see your work, which you've only spoken to me about before, but lovely to see all the, the backing presentations and what have you. If I understood it, one of your comments was sort of the geomorphology of the submerged valleys was sort of broad and, and not very deeply incised. And you said, well, we don't see anything like that around here now. Now, if I'm displaying my ignorance, you can correct me. But what, what, what I think of is that presumably this is because it's a submerging coastline, whereas you might find the Mozambique coastline um, more in, uh, like what's been submerged because that's an emerging coastline. I think particularly of the Limpopo Valley at uh, Shai Shai. <laughs> That's, thank you, Ants. That's actually an excellent point. Um, when I was writing up my PhD and I was trying to think of analogues back then just for the marine geology, 
um, I thought of them a Putinland coastal plain because of, but it's obviously a difference in vegetation and climate and everything else. But the gradients would have been pretty similar. Um, and this, the rain project that I mentioned, where we've cored parts of the seafloor, we actually have some cores from the Limpopo um, shelf as well. So it would be fascinating to take a look at those. And I hadn't thought of linking them up actually. So thank you for that comment. Makes sense. Good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. <laughs> Out of the desert. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that wasn't very submerged. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Hi, yes, Rabanat here. Um, can I ask a couple? The first one is, I was always under the impression that in an ice age, South Africa became very dry. We didn't have ice sheets coming down south, but the, but the climate was much drier. Your explanation of the environment is very different. It actually is, or was, quite a bit wetter. Um, and then you mentioned silcretes. On the South African coast with silcretes, you get kalinization uh, kal and also the form of um, sort of iron oxide concentrations. Um, I was just wondering if you found any of those. Thanks. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so we, part of this bigger project was a climate model that was run. Well, two things that were climatically relevant. One of them, um, if you send me your details later, I can email them to you. There's a paper written by Kirsten Brown, and she looked at speleothem records and what that means for climates along the Cape South Coast. There also there have been several studies on that, that topic as well for this area. Um, there's a bit of an argument about whether winter rain would dominate more in the glacials or summer rain dominating more in the glacials. Um, and at the moment, it hasn't been possible to differentiate which that is. Um, the hypothesis behind the winter rain is that climate belts would shift southwards and, um, sorry, shift northwards. So as the ice sheet in the south is pushing north, that the climate zones are shifted north in sequence. And that the winter rain area around Cape Town and south would dominate around the Cape South Coast as well. That's the first idea. The second one is that summer rain might be more dominant because with a low sea level, the coast is closer to the core of the Agalis current, which might make for some different um, climatic peculiarities in terms of moisture and um, driving orographic rain systems. So there's the water coming from above, which um, obviously is quite argued at the moment. Um, from my geology work, I'm mostly probably looking at influence from the ground ta groundwater table below. Because if you think of that shelf, there are the Cape Mountains on the current coastal plain, very hard Ordovician quartzites and things like that. They're abutted by softer Mesozoic siltstones and claystones. Um, the Cape Mountains hold beautiful aquifers of water, as we all know. And if the seepage from the aquifers um, took place towards base level, it probably seeped through muddy, silty deposits rather than flowing along fractures and faults, things like that. And the thinking is that when you lower sea level out there, the water table is right near the, the surface of the shelf, which would have been a landscape. Um, and then for, yeah, the silkretes, those are fascinating. We actually have a lot more um, work planned in that regard. Um, at the moment, people know a few, little bit about silkretes. No one's entirely sure actually how old they are. Um, the original thinking is that they probably all formed in one go at the KT boundary time. Um, and they, they're pretty extensive around the Cape South Coast, but generally they're sitting on Bockefeld shales um, about 50 meters above sea level and higher, not really right at the, at the, at the coast. Um, I do think that Silk Creek cobbles may have made their way to the coast through the rivers at the time, um, maybe coming from the Langplur or the, the Klein Karoo somewhere. Um, but yeah, we're pretty unsure about those for now. None of our marine cores penetrated anything that looked like Silk Creek, um, probably because I was targeting river channels and lakes and things for um, more recent paleoclimate evidence. But yeah, we're still busy with <laughs> figuring all this out. I don't know if I answered you properly, Rob. 
Thank you. Yes, you did. Sorry, what is your email? You said uh, you could send me some stuff on the climate. Oh, I can type it into a chat box. It's thank you. It's my no, that'll name. be fine. That'll no, that'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm I'll typing it now. One more question or comment. Going once, going twice, going three times. <laughs> Haley, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I've seen a version of this before, and this brings it home even even better. Uh, what a complex place the South Coast is, and what it can tell us about sea level rise and fall and so forth. I think it's fascinating stuff. So thank you very much for this, for doing this for the GSSA. Uh, just a reminder, Haley's also giving a talk for the Oberberg Geoscientist Group on Thursday, 21st May, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. on the the Pleistocene rocks 2.5 million years to the recent de deposits uh, on our coast uh, with an emphasis on, on the Walker Bay area. Now to get into that meeting you can go to the GSSA website and look for the Google Calendar and the entry details will be there. Uh, so that's happening on Thursday. Our next uh, talk is going to be on fr uh, Friday 22nd of May 1 to 1 30 p.m. Dr. James Cleverly, getting to the geoinformation with an infield analysis data. So keep keep your eyes open for that. Uh, this rec this talk has been recorded, and it will be available on the GSSA YouTube channel shortly. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Thank you, Haley, again for doing this for us. I think it was a fascinating and interesting talk. Uh, and with Thanks, that, I'll end the meeting shortly. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Cheers. Thanks so much, Haley. Thanks, Robin. Thank <laughs> you. Ciao. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, all.